Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Thriving Adoptees podcast. And have we got our treat for you today? Um, Marcy's got up very early and put uh, put her uh, best glasses and her best uh, best foot forward, her best face on. She's looking absolutely radiant because she thought it might be video, but we're only doing audio. So this is this is just like I, I'm the only one enjoying the vision that is Marcy this morning. Welcome to the show, Marcy. Thanks for getting up so early. Oh, thank you so much, Simon. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Hi. So could you introduce yourself to the audience, please? Marcy? Absolutely. Uh, my name is Marcy Keithley, and I reside in the U.S. in the state of Indiana. I'm from southern Indiana in a little town called Jeffersonville, which is right across the river from Louisville, Kentucky. I am recently retired, Simon. You didn't know this. But I did know this. I, yes. I saw that on I saw that on on Facebook. On yeah. Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. So I can dedicate myself a full time to writing as I am an author. And I do I am the president of the National Association of Adoptees and Parents, also known as NAP. Yeah. And you're also a first mom and an adoptive mom. I'm a first mom in reunion since 2008 and also an adoptive mom. That is correct. Yeah. So um, before we before we press record, uh, you read a, a couple of sentences, uh, a, a passage from from one of your, your books. And I thought that would be a really great point to jump off the conversation. So could could you share those with the listeners, please, Matsy? Absolutely. And I want your listeners to know this is from my book called The Shoebox Effect. I want you to know this, there's magic in your mess. You may have to sit in it for a bit or sift through all the broken pieces of your life, but those dysfunctional shards and your distorted sense of self are actually the makings of a new, stronger and better you. Wow, I love that. Thank you. I love that. Um, and I heard something, I, I heard something very similar about 18 months ago, not as poetic and a little bit briefer. And that's that um, uh, our mess becomes our message. So what what's your message, Marcy? Take or, one step. Or, or what was your mess? What was your mess? Wow. Maybe that's... Your mess becomes your message and your message becomes your mission. Okay. That's for me. Okay. Um, yeah, my mess, wow, uh, it was a big one, uh, but it all started back in the fall of 2007 with the rediscovery of a old shoebox that I had created in 1978 when I came home from the hospital with no baby. Uh, that's where my mess started. And as a mother of loss, we had no counseling or therapy or support. We were just told to go away and pretend it never happened. Just pretend it never happened, that we never gave birth. So for us mothers, we were living secretly. We were living a lie. And back then, this grief overtook me. And I had to hide it and I couldn't share it with anyone. That's actually where my mess began. And I had to find a way out by myself as a, young, as a young girl. So I could wake up each morning and face myself in the mirror after giving my baby away to strangers. That's where the whole thing started. And I rediscovered the shoebox Simon in my closet that fall. And it was at the same it's time. 30 years later, yeah? Yes, this is 30 years later. Almost. When I discovered this shoebox. And what happens for me is that I was already at a crossroads in my life. Now, by all standards, I was living the American dream. I had a, a great job. I had a six-figure salary. I had my dream home. I had the Lexus in the driveway. I even had a golden retriever. I was in a marriage of 17 years. But at that point in my life, things were starting to unravel inside. On the outside, I had it together, successful, 
and and for all appearances happy but inside i was starting to to crumble and come unravel because i had carried the secret for so long and that moment in the fall of my that fall in my closet i found my dog who i had been trying to i've been avoiding denying putting him down because he had cancer i was denying that my marriage was falling apart after 17 years and i needed to sign the divorce papers and i was denying what was inside that box which was all the pain that i had tried to wrap up in a little box and hide all these years and it was in that moment in my closet that i realized that it was time to open the lid to go back to my past to find the daughter i surrendered to adoption and the only way in my mind at that time was to or the only way i could thought of that i could find her was to start with him the birth father who was my first love that's wow. kind of where my story begins wow so what what did you learn along your story along the story I learned that we all obviously have trials and tribulations. We all have challenges. But when you really set amongst the, the broken pieces of your life, if you can shift through, you know, sift through all of those pieces, there's meaning. There's opportunity. And for me, once I was able to step into the light and shed myself of those secrets, and be who I was without fear. You know, I could finally say, I surrendered a child to, to adoption. You know, I am a first mother. It, it empowered me. And then obviously to begin to work in the adoption community and to make those connections with other mothers and adoptees and listen to, to their stories um, and the difficulties that they had. That set me on the yeah. a different path yeah wow meaning opportunity and very powerful stuff here very powerful stuff. i think we all walk around with these narratives in our head that aren't true <clears throat> and then some of us choose those narratives because we're running from something very painful and for me it was the loss of my daughter and I overcompensated in other ways. Like I just decided to build a career for myself and I hid behind that. But once the career was gone and you, you find that out, what happens to that when things start to fall apart and I'm just there naked with no, you know, there's, there's no career that I'm standing by. There's no bad, you know, no wall at all whatsoever. It's just me standing there. I had to face some truths and not only did I have to find my own. The, my story takes a huge twist and forces me to go back into my own childhood and my own personal loss of my mother. And it explained a lot. And by going back, stepping back into that and working through that loss, it just opened my eyes and I gained this awareness of how we all can come to terms with loss if we just seek meaning if we if we find a way once we accept our losses grief and joy can live in duality we can there's going to be times when we're, we're all sad when we grieve our losses and you're never going to be a hundred percent in in great times and standing in joy so there's a balance to that and that's what i learned is if i can just find that balance. And it, it took me about 10 years to do that, but I think I successfully, successfully managed that and was able to, to write the book. And um, yeah. So one of the most empowering five days of my life was spent exploring the fact that we are not a narrative. Correct. We are not our narrative. And we are yeah. not our story. 
we well we're not a narrative and, uh, and we are not our story um yeah that i spent five days on that now yes. and i've just said it in five seconds so this stuff is it's not a, it's not a thinking thing it's not a rational thing it's like uh well, I, I, I call it a, a bath of love. And, and, and a, a bath of love with some, uh, <laughs> with uh, some unconditional understanding as, as bath salts. Uh, and you, you, you were explaining to me before, again, before we started recording, that you'd just come back from a, a conference with, uh, a, a, and something magical had happened. And to me, that that felt like the the bath of the bath of love, bath of love, mm-hmm. bath of love the unconditional love, uh, and the energy. I don't, I don't know if you can feel an energy between us in, in this moment. Can you feel that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I felt it the first time we spoke. Yeah. Uh, so we've got the energy of, of, of two people here. Yeah. The, the energy that you, uh, uh, but we're, we're, we're separated by nine, nine inches from screen to screen or 3,000 miles, 4,000 miles um, with hyperspace. But you were you were in LA with this group, yes. Um, so I, I'm I'm wondering what what do you because we'd like to we'd like to join. I, I'm I'm describing this and I'm asking these questions really because I'm I'm hoping I'm welcoming I'm inviting the listener in to this bath of bath of love. And I'm thinking that me asking you to describe what the bath of love and the magic that happened for you in, in this conference at LA might help them uh, feel the temperature of the water in the bath of love. Yeah, the, uh, the conference was this past weekend. It was a two day conference in um, Marina del Rey, um, a sub up there of, of LA. And they concern united birth parents has been around since 1976 and i've you know i've known a few of the mothers there throughout the years um however i was so busy building a uh, a organization and and legislating for access to records in my state and and uh, advocacy that i really didn't have a lot of extra time but um i chose uh my partner and I, Jennifer Falsing, who is the co-founder of our organization, she is also a first mother. We decided that this year was the year and we went together. These mothers, Simon, um, they come from all walks of life. And they came as young as 20, I think that the youngest was 29 and the oldest was 83. I think we had three over 80 years old. Wow. Mothers who had surrendered their children from across the nation. And, uh, you know, two were on walkers, one was on a cane, but they came. And that speaks volumes to me. The age of those mothers that are still coming to Cub after all these years. And when you put a group of women together who have a common loss, yes, magic started to happen. When you start to hear the stories, um, some from back in, in the, again, the fifties, it just, my heart, well, you know, I, I don't even, I, I don't even have to say it. I, I, like I said, I came back from that going, my heart is so full just to be in the same room of women that got it, that had very similar experiences and listening to them, their stories and speaking through their tears. It was so empowering. And there were a few there that were very, very quiet and did did not want to speak at all. But those mothers reached out 
and comforted those who, you know, who were having a difficult time. And it was just the, 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 the power of connection is so strong that I, you know, I just really can't even describe it, but magic takes place when you're with your community of like-minded individuals. Yeah. I, I used to think of connection as like holding hands. Um, now I see it uh, as a, as a space or, um, as a, this bath of love that I explained that, you know, that, that's my metaphor for what, um, what this is and on words can't explain. We used to, we, you know, we used to listen to podcasts with strategies and tactics and how to's and the whole world's kind of set up on, on that, on this rational basis when all, you know, like all we want is to be loved. Isn't it? Yeah. And to so be heard. We want to be, be heard. heard. We want to be heard. And we want, uncon we want to be heard. We want to be unconditionally loved. Uh, and we got you listeners. We have you. We, we, we have you. This is a, this is a safe, this is a safe space. So what would you like to share with the, uh, I don't know how many birth mothers we have listened to this show. I really don't. I don't know. I'm assuming that most of the listeners are adoptive parents and adoptees. I know that 57% of them are in the U S but I don't know how we, how we split down into the different parts of the uh, consolation or the, um, or the tribe, but what would you like to share? What would you like to share with the listeners? Well, I'd be happy to share a little bit more of my story, especially um, the fact that I am an adoptive mom and a first mother for your listeners. Um, as I shared with you earlier, you know, the rediscovery of the shoebox in my closet set me on a, uh, a path. I, it was known, but unknown, but I end, end up opening the lid to that box and revisiting my past. I go back to um, 1977 and I do end up finding the father of my child within a short period of time. He was my first love. We got married four months later after 30 years and we went on our search for our daughter together and we found her on Father's Day 2008. So she, she did not have a positive adoption experience. In fact, it was very, very difficult. And she was 29 years old at the time. And I, she was living with her adoptive mother, her, um, and her children, her adoptive father had passed away. And uh, in the last couple, about three years before we found her, but her parents divorced when she was three. So she, she had a very difficult time. She and her children come to Indiana to live with us as we came at the, we, we, met, we found her at the perfect time as her adoptive mother was dying of cancer. And she passed away uh, several months after that. So we took our daughter in and our grandchildren and, and tried to help them. Mm. Yeah, so mm. it, was, it was very difficult. Um, in fact, um, our daughter left the home after about eight months and she kept going back and forth and back and forth. Uh, but finally we, you know, we, we had a, I call it the dance of reunion because she was in and out of reunion with us. Um, but she, you know, she was denied her original birth certificate and she could not get her medical inf uh, information. And, and as a result of that, she suffered a stroke at 22 and it did severe damage to her mentally. So she, she was, she struggles. She really needs a lot of help. So um, after so many years, she had asked us finally if she could, um, she wanted to change her name after her, her mother died and asked if I would help her to give her, re restore her, her birth name, especially now that her father and I were married. So we decided to surprise her on her birthday and go ahead and hire an attorney to do the name change. 
Well, my husband said, well, why don't we take it one step further and why don't we just go ahead and legally adopt her? So we terminated the infant adoption and adopted her back so and restored her birthright. So that's how I became an adoptive mom. Wow. So she now has her name that I gave her at birth and she has um, her birth certificates, has all the true information on it now as the one before said she was born in a different hospital in a different city, it was all changed. So now she has the real one. So that's how I became an adoptive mom. Wow. Um, Unusual. Yeah. At, at, uh, in, 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 the, in the passage that you read from the book, you took, I think you used the word identity. Did you use the word identity from that? I, from, from my, the passage yeah. from my book, identity? Mm, no. No? Oh. That was the other passage I read. That you must have been another book. passage, yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, 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 as you were sharing that part of your story with me, um, uh, I had a, a flashback to the moment I got my original birth certificate. And I saw my original name. So you're talking to Simon Jonathan Ben, but I was David Anthony Farr. And in that moment, I thought, hmm, I've had two names. And the next thought that came into my head was, I, I, if I've had two names, I can't actually be either. So like the truth is always true, right? Yes. Truth, the, truth, the truth never changes. Nope. So the truth of who we are isn't our name. It's something, it, to me, it's something deeper than that. Does that make any sense to you? It, it does. So, you know, like it's a, uh, it, we've all we're, we've all got a, we've all got a case of mistaken identity because we're identifying ourselves with our name, and we're not our name. Um, and yeah, the the identity thing, people talk a lot about that. People talk a lot about identity struggles in uh, in in in, adop in the adoption world. How did it feel for your daughter to, well, how did it feel for you, for your daughter to have her name back? It was really exciting for me. I mean, I always wanted to support her in whatever she chose. I mean, from the very beginning, I didn't even know my place, you know, when we first were in reunion. So I was very careful to, to make this, just to let her know that this was about her. This wasn't about me. And, you know, I called her by her, adoptive name and uh, but you know she when she found out that we named her she wanted me to call her that right off the bat but I didn't want to disrespect her um, adoptive mother and you know I was trying to carefully find my place with that situation um, around her mom because her mom was um, she was pretty upset about the whole thing and you know, we had to have a series of discussions and we had to get a professional to come in and help us mediate, um, which did help. But, you know, there's plenty of love to go around. So, you know, although we weren't trying to take her place, she, you know, her health had suffered to the point where she could no longer take care of our daughter and, the, and those grandchildren. And like I said, I think we came in at the, at the right at the right time. But yeah, I was very excited about it. And our, our daughter, you know, that was just something that she wanted. She said, I want to be me. I don't want to be somebody. She, she would always say, I don't want to be what you want me to be. I don't want what daddy wants me to be. I just want to be me. And to her, me was who we named her. Yeah. 
she said she wanted she wanted to take some control she said i want my name that belongs to me yeah so there's there's a there's a bit of a um a paradox between what i said and what you just said i mean does this so what i said about the fact that um I realize that I'm not my name and that none of us are our names. We're all uh, under a mistaken, you know, we're all laboring under a mistaken identity. Does that feel significant to you or does that just feel like a weird philosophical statement from some British? Yeah, well, you know, it was significant for our daughter. That's the way she interpreted. That's okay. what she wanted. Yes. Um, and like I said, I just supported that, but I hear what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it goes to the heart of what, you know, what we are, the identity piece. You know, so, um, I heard this expressed quite well, um, recently. So from six foot away, I look like a, a guy, but if I came and, and from, so f you you can see the top half of my body in, in my head, right? If I backed off, you'd see you'd, you'd see the whole of my, you'd see my whole body. But I could come really close into the zoom camera, and all you would see is a bit of my flesh. And if you had a a, a microphone, I'm sorry, a, mi a microscope, you could you could see you could see underneath my skin to the molecules and stuff like that. So what we see, or, or, you know, and if I had a name badge on, right, if I had a name badge on and I was close enough, you'd be able to read my name badge. So who we, who we are is a matter of our uh, perspective. Who, who other people seem to be is a matter of perspective, our distance between the two of them. So like, like this identity thing is, is a bit tricky or it's not quite as fixed as we think. Um, I want to take you back to that thing that you said about uh, grief and joy can live in duality because I found that a fascinating a fascinating comment what 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 do you mean by that Marcy? okay I describe this in my book too because I was under the assumption for for the longest time that because I was successful, okay, that there couldn't be anything else. I couldn't have anything else with it. I mean, it was just, if I was successful and I was living this great life, I really couldn't have anything else. I could only think of that one thing. So this brokenness and this emptiness that I felt inside that I couldn't name, that, that I was living with, I was trying to stuff that down. I was trying to deny that, but it was surfacing as I got older and it was surfacing. And it was like, as I shared with you, that box was created because I was trying to, I was brokenhearted the day that I came home from the hospital and in my young mind, I thought if I could park the pain and put a lid on it somewhere that I could go out into the world and I was going to be okay but you can only hold a secret for so long before that starts to fester and it starts to bubble up. And the truth, the really truth of, of, of my life and who I was, it just, it just, it came out. So when I, when I say, when I talk about that, the, the, the box analogy is that, you know, we all suffer loss and grief and, you know, we talk about closure and to me, closure is a myth. I mean, there is no end to this. As individuals, when we experience loss and grief, we need to find, obviously, first of all, there, there has to be an awareness and then an acceptance. And what I found is that, it, that knowing that I can still live with grief and loss, I can still, there is that balance, that they, those two things can, can go together. You may be sad one day, but you can still live in joy, but you have to seek it. You have to seek it out. And a, a lot of times when I was at my darkest place, when I, 
I wasn't in, in joy at all. I wasn't aware that just by listening to someone else's story and offering, you know, being the listener, it helps raise that level of awareness and it, it helped me. And that's why, you know, we talked about this earlier that we're not our stories, but when we share our stories, we become the, the storyteller. Then you can step back and you can look and be a little bit more objective. And that's what, that's what happened for me. That box represented nothing but grief and pain initially, but I found that I could still live and I could still, you know, have joy in my life and that the two can live together just like you can be broken and successful. I didn't know that. I thought I just had to be on my A game all the time, but those two things can live together. Yeah. I had, I, funny enough, I had the same, I had the same um, realization uh, of uh, broken and successful over the weekend. Yeah. Um, you can, you can so, those the, the, the thing that popped into my ha- head, and it, it may be a little bit, well, I don't know. It, it's like an X and a Y axis. You know, like a, a graph. But you, you know, so the X and the Y axis. So sometimes you see the graph and you just see, you, you just see, you know, like um, two, two sides of a triangle. Yeah. And sometimes you see a graph and it's got the, it, it's, it's more like a cross because it's mm-hmm. got the, the positive and the negative on. So the fact that um, uh, s- success is um, maybe the, 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 the y-axis, but life is, and, and wholeness is the x-axis. The two things, are, I, I was reading an article by, uh, reading an, an interview with a, 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 one of the, richest guys in here in the UK. And he was mega successful, like billions and also broken. And they're the two completely independent factors. They, 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 they are the two different axes of a graph. And we're led to, you know, you talked about the American dream, but it's the it's the it's the British dream as well. It's the um, it's the Western dream. This idea that we will get to success when we get to success, we'll be happy, we'll be whole, uh, and a a a, a um, I heard a mentor of mine talking about this because he he uh, and how he was disillusioned when he found out that that wasn't the case. Right, so he, he he had a figure that he thought would, you know, it would uh, satiate satiate his wounds, if you like, or satisfy him, or whatever. Uh, and then he happened to be uh, he, he happened to be coaching a guy who told him that he was worth six hundred thousand dollars. But this guy wake, wakes up every morning thinking that he could this could be the day when he loses it all. So security, emotional security, and um, and our bank balance are two completely unrelated factors. Absolutely. Uh, 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 but I, I learned this for myself 14 years ago, and that was kind of the start of my, that was kind of the start of my, uh, consciousness journey when I'd never been particularly motivated by money towards it I'd always been upset about losing it but I've never really been I, I, I thought well once I get to X then I'll I'll be happy and I'll stop worrying but it, it didn't work out that way so. no never does <laughs> it never does so grief, grief and joy can live in, 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 live in duality. So I heard somebody saying yesterday that um, suffering is rejection. 
So if we re, uh, uh, use using that uh, um, using that kind of statement, if we reject our grief, we hide the grief in the box, then we suffer. Whereas if we accept the grief, like we're with we we are okay with not being okay then we're always okay, right? I think so. You know, suffering is rejection. And you think about that. What happened, what happens to us, happened to us. But we have a choice. And suffering is a choice. Because then you're choosing to remain to be a victim. But when we choose acceptance, and then we find our own way like we were talking about, we navigate through the mess and then we do find the meaning. Yeah. And that's, that's where the freedom is. That's where the peace is. Is it most of our, most of us aren't choosing though, right? That most of us aren't choosing. That's, that's it right there. You have to choose it. Most of us aren't choosing because uh, our uh, uh, the, the the voice in our head is the one that's choosing how how what what we do how we feel what we think and most importantly what we think of ourselves how we see ourselves so this is why. Um, I'm this is why the primal wound took me down because I believe I, I, I didn't think I would I didn't feel wounded until I read the primal wound once I saw myself as wounded yeah and you know that brings me to another passage in my book about the wounded. Do you mind? Go for it. Denial is a mask the wounded wear. And for me, once I shed the role of the consummate actress and stepped into my truth, all of it, all of it, I was able to shed the emotional shackles that kept me a prisoner for decades. And I finally found my clarity and purpose. Beautiful. So what's your truth? Your truth is facing everything that's happened to you from the, the, from the loss of my child to my mother abandoning me at five years old. Everything and everything that happened in between. It's coming. It's, it's. Sorry, listeners, we're frozen there. Marcy, we're back in there. Great. You have. Sorry, sorry, Marcy, we uh, we lost you there. Um, if we just go back to it, so you said um, I asked you. So, what's your truth? And you talked about you went to you talked about being uh, abandoned by your mother at five years old, which sent uh, shivers down my spine. Uh, but then we uh, we lost you. Then the the yeah. I, I, it was, again, uh, losing my daughter, losing my mother at five years old, being abandoned by her with no explanation, and the events and that belief system that kicked in as that small child. My narrative, my story, which was false. And living that. But once you're able to face the truth of, of the things that happened in your life, then you get this clarity then you can, you can move, you can start to make wholesome decisions for yourself, wise choices. Isn't the truth, sorry, this is just my opinion. Is it? I'm not sure. I'm just asking a question, I guess. Um, isn't the truth underneath, isn't the truth who we are underneath the belief system? Exactly. It is. It's who you are. 
Yeah. Without that mask. Without that mask. Because when you're wounded, you're hiding from the truth. So you're 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 running around with this different story and you're living you're living you're living falsely. Yeah. What's, once you what, get into your authentic self, it's totally different. What's wounded, Marcy? Oh, my soul was wounded. My heart was wounded. Not feeling love, not feeling wanted, feeling worthless, unlovable. And I carried that around for a long time. And I was trying to fix myself and poor choices. Yeah. We all do that, you know. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I had to learn all about generational trauma, too. There was there was a, there's a lot there to, to my story of how I go back and get the whole story from my mother and find out, you know, what happened to her, my sister. And once we were able, we were able to talk about all those things and, you know, come to terms with all of those things. And it's, it was no longer a secret. And it, it was out. That's what I'm saying. The truth. It's it really it might be a cliche, but it really is true. The truth does set you free. There's a piece of, about that and knowing that you don't have to look over your shoulder anymore. That you're truly standing there in that sacred place and knowing you're okay. So what's, if you were to sum it up in one, in, in one sentence, what, what is the truth that sets us free? Being our authentic self and the ex and the acceptance of who we are by the authentic self you mean what's underneath the belief system absolutely no longer carrying that false narrative in our head or acting out that false narrative in our lives just being who we are If you were to sum up who we are in one word, what would you, what, what word would you use? Love. Yeah. That, that's the word I was going to use too. Yeah, love. <laughs> to me, I think there, there's two things. I think if, if we learn to love, to love others, but we have first have to love ourselves, And that's where I think as humans, I think we really fail ourselves. Uh, we haven't done a very good job of loving ourselves. Nobody well, taught. I really, I, you know, I really didn't understand self-love. Truly did not understand it. But loving yourself, loving others, it, and forgiveness. Those two, love and forgiveness. If... If we, if we think that we're our belief system, then we, if we think that we, were, we are our belief system, if we think that we are our story, then that's, that's not lovable, is it? Mm -mm. That's not lovable. That's not, that's so, not, yeah, so that's the, not lovable. So the, the, for the state, the state, the state, the, I, I you know, I referred earlier on as to, uh, to the, um, case of mistaken identity i what's not to love about love absolutely uh so i want to have i have i shared my meta, my diamond metaphor with you well you have several of those so let's let's go <laughs> you have a lot of metaphors so yeah share please share. yeah it's and, and it's sorry i i said it's mine it's not mine um uh it it, it it's a it's a, a metaphor from a, a mentor of mine, a guy called Michael Neal. So um, there's there's a <laughs> there's a there's a pile of you've got a golden retriever, yeah. You mentioned golden retriever. Just uh, sorry, uh -huh. yeah. So we've we've got a like a, a she's supposed to be fox red, but she's actually really golden Labrador. So we've got a golden Labrador. And we've also got a chocolate Labrador who's a bit older, right? So 
um right they 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 go outside and there's there's dog poop in the yard right <laughs> yeah yes we we think we're poop we think we're poop we think we're poop yes yes i would agree with that uh, we most of us you know like the the poop is the is, is the you know not good enough 99.9% .9 of the people I've met in my life that I've talked about this stuff don't think that they're good enough, right? So we think we're poop. Well, underneath all the poop, we've been through poop. You've been through poop. Your mother abandoning you at five. That's serious poop. The stuff that you went through with the surrender of, of your, your daughter, serious poop. I, I've been surrendered as well serious poop but that what what we've been through and 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 the feelings that come through uh, 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 <laughs> that, that come from what we've been through aren't who we are because in that in that pile of poop done by Lexi or or, or Rosie our two Labradors is a diamond and the, that diamond is who we are and that that diamond is the diamond is, is the metaphor for for love so we don't love ourselves because we think ourselves is the poop we don't see ourselves as the diamond sure good analogy the poop analogy the poop analogy love it but and and the the trauma all the trauma is in the poop and all the world is obsessed with the trauma we have a we have a trauma obsession yes we do yes we do we're looking in the wrong place. You know, the other, the other thing that I use all the time is this. Sorry, listeners, if you've not heard this or if you have heard this before, but I, I, I can't hear this enough. We're, we're spiritual beings having a human experience. So for spiritual beings, I mean love. I mean diamond. For human experience, I mean the poop we've been through the trauma we feel uh, and the narrative in our head, mm -hmm. the story of who we are. The story of who we are is, is, in, the, is in the human experience and, and, you know, human experience, life, life's a contact sport. It, you know, we, we get knocked down, we get back up again because it's a song by Chumbawamba, uh, because, <laughs> because of that diamond that uh, drives our, uh, that, that, that drives, drives what we do, drives what you did to go back to the start. And that was something I wasn't prepared for when I was writing my book. See, my book took a huge turn. Yeah. I was not prepared for my story, which all I was going was sharing was a story about um, my daughter and and my husband, and it. But the the memoir was just takes on a took it took on a life of its own, and it just pulled me in that direction, and and it forced me to go back there. Yeah. Then I had to go there to that dark place that I mentioned. Then I had to process all of that. Yeah. Before I so, can even write. Yeah, so processing it really, um, to me, it feels like um, poop mining. It it it, it feels like it's it, the, the the processing it. It feels like it was you know like you would process if you were uh, if you were processing if you had a pile of poo on a on a um, if you're a diamond miner. Right. And you've got a pile of you've got a pile of poo going on your conveyor belt, then processing it is actually moving the poop out of the way to reveal the diamond underneath. That's what processing feels like to me. Um, but, you know, something also gets in the way when you're doing that. Is. When you're going back like that. Then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I found out that there's there's another voice in there. There's another person that I had to answer to, and that was 
the little Marcy, just like there's a little Simon. Right. The child, the child Marcy, the child Simon. There's a conversation going on there too. And then I had to realize that she needed protecting. It, it, it was she that was hurting. It wasn't the adult Marcy. It was child Marcy. The therapist helped me with that. And yeah. Is that another, is, yeah. is, that a, is that a different layer of poop? <laughs> That's a different layer of poop. <laughs> That so, was a, an awakening. I'm, awakening, yeah. Awakening is seeing the, the 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 diamond or the love or the spiritual being of who we are underneath the poop, the poopy uh, behavior that we sometimes do, the poopy uh, feelings, and the poopy thoughts in our head. wow so what would you like to call this episode marcy <laughs> let's stay away from poop yeah let's stay away from poop oh what could we call this episode um well it really you know it really is about the shoebox effect the actual <laughs> that's what i lived my life that's what i discovered is you know the shoebox effect is real you know, that's an actual term. But I use that an analogy because as human beings, you know, we do the same thing. We take those painful experiences or those things that we don't want to face and we throw them into a shoebox, whether it's a physical one or a spiritual one or an emotional one. Um, and we want to throw it in the closet and throw sweaters on it and just pretend it never happened but there is a, a payday for what we fail to face in our past. And it's only when you can lift that lid off, make that decision to lift that lid off and accept, learn acceptance and go back that you're, like I said, and acknowledge who you truly are and live in your truth that you are finally free of it. Beautiful. So I'm gonna put some links uh, obviously in, uh, in the show notes to the book, um, to your website, to Nap and um, and to you on, on, on social and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I have a brand new website that I haven't even shared uh, yet. So you're welcome to go ahead. And I also have a book two coming out uh, next month. And it's actually a, a workbook for those individuals that like to want to do a little bit of inner work about how to break free from their past, uh, learn empowerment and discover purpose. Fantastic. What dates, it, what, what, date, what dates it out? Have you got a date for it? It's going to be right at the end of November. Right. I don't have a date yet. Okay. But it, it'll be, it'll be linked to, it, it, it'll be accessible from your yeah, website. website. Yes. So, mm -hmm. so when, when it's available. So when are people, we're recording this um, the 27th of October, 2021 uh, listeners. Yeah. So uh and Frankie and Friends talk adoption. So this is so that you've been talking about adult books so far. That's clearly a correct kids book. Yeah. And I also have the children's book called Frankie and Friends Talk Adoption. Yeah. And this cute little guy. And this book was written for adoptive parents. So it's it's really written for the littlest of ad adoptees that. Um, meant for the um, the youngest of the, the adopted children and their parents to navigate through the feelings often experienced but difficult to articulate. And Frankie's this little made up guy and he validates what an adoptive child might be feeling. 
So it can help the adoptive parents to form the questions to help them since they can't articulate for themselves. And we do it through this fun little guy. So did I tell you that I was told about my adoption with the aid of a storybook? Did I tell you that? No, no, you did not. Yeah. I, this is a, a, a stunning bit of, I, I don't know, one of the conversations I had a couple of weeks ago was about this, is that you tell your kid, tell your child, adopted child, that they're adopted before they know what that means. You know, you think you have to wait until they know what the word means. I tell them before. <laughs> wow. Um, so thank you very much for, for, for your time, Marty. It's been a, a beautiful conversation. You're quite welcome. You, thank you so much for having me. And, um, and I hope you've enjoyed it too, listeners. Um, I have. Thank you, listeners. See you all soon. Speak to you soon. I keep on saying that. Bye-bye.